Hello, all you people. I'm Laz. And I'm Cody. And we're not across the pond, but across the, the other, other pond. pond. The show where we light the warmth inside of our brains. I meant to say fire instead of warmth, but now we're stuck with it. Yep, the warmth. I like the, uh, to light the warmth inside our brains. That's 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 catchy. That's hip, and it's something that I think I would hear on the streets. Okay, dude, I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling good. <laughs> All right, uh, so Cody, what are we, what are we talking, talking about today? About today? What are we, we're, <laughs> uh, we're talking about Taoism today, uh, mm-hmm. sometimes known as the way. Taoism if you're Western. <laughs> It starts mm-hmm. with a T. <laughs> yeah, and do you know why? Do you know why? Why it starts with a T? Yeah, why Why does all the uh, Chinese names and stuff look a little funky, like, over here? Um, I'm pretty sure it's because we transliterate it. Well, there, there's actually, before you had pinyin, which is the phonetic, uh, like, kind of alphabet they use for typing in characters nowadays and learning like the phonetic sounds of the language especially when they're kids before you had the wade skiles system that had a whole completely different way of transliterating everything like things that used to be shown as ch now are zh or like even uh q like there is not sometimes not differentiation between things because the English people that made it probably couldn't hear the difference. I would say they're you really know? old. Like what the ways Gal system is from like the 1800s, right? I, Maybe probably, before that. I, I thought it was like early 19th century, but it probably is earlier than that. I don't even know. I've never looked it up. I will say but, all of these translations that we're looking at stem from like 1920 to 1946, I think. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. kind of interesting that all of that comes from that era of translation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like um, it it was a very confusing time because of like, um, especially, you know, China not being like a leader in technology like every other place. They were still in the Qing Dynasty and whatnot, and kind of closing themselves out off from the rest of the world. And then around the later 1800s, that's when the British were like, hey, trade with us or else. And they're like, we're going to choose or else. And they're like, <laughs> okay, well, here's some opium for all your people. And then that's how they started getting to trade because they got people addicted to opium. And then they're like, ah, shoot, <laughs> we're going to have to trade with you. <laughs> yeah, you, you're the only supplier. We got to have it. We got to have that stuff, man. Yeah, it, it's a lot worse than I, I make it. It it was it was pretty bad for for the Chinese people, you know. But like, um, it was kind of the Qing Dynasty just being an asshole and not wanting to. I mean, the J- Japanese dynasties also did that, and the Western pa- powers also kind of forced them at, to open. Everyone up Everyone well. were just being assholes to each other. Yeah, really. Back really in the day, t- it was like it was like conquer or be conquered kind of thing. So. You know, and of course, all the just lay folks suffered. But anyway, we're talking about the way. The, the way. Very mm-hmm. exciting. Um, mm-hmm. Quick, before we get into, because we're going to be talking about the first sec, the first chapter of each of the two big sections of the Tao Te Ching. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So before we get into the actual philosophical arguments that we're going into here. Um, a little bit of history on Taoism. Well, first of all, we'll tell people why, like, there, you're, there's two p- parts to it, right? Because, okay. uh, like, okay, so it's called the Tao De Jing. So in in Chinese, Tao is like the way. It's like the the kind of like the force of the universe, kind of thing. The workings of the universe, the inner workings of the universe, this mysterious kind of thing. Then De is translated to like virtue and whatnot but what it can what it's kind of uh uh explained as in the Tao Te Ching is this kind of um 
manifestation of the way, right? Your, well, manifestation of the way and the manifestation of the action of the sage, which they, they use this term shengren, which is translated, and I think pretty well to the sage and it's kind of like the perfect person kind of thing uh-huh. but yeah so like so with the Tao De Jing, you the first 37 chapters is called the De, the Tao Jing. so Jing here meaning scripture or like book or like a very high level script like a book kind of thing like a classic almost uh-huh. and so the first part is Dao Jing, so the Dao scripture, and the second part is the Du Jing, which is thirty chapter thirty eight to eighty eight. I think there's eighty one is 81, what it says sorry. here. Yeah, I'm. It's eighty one. Sorry, <laughs> but the, yeah, like that. You have those two parts, and the scholars wonder what order it is in. Like a, a, most of them, you'll see is Dao Jing first, and then the Du Jing, but then there's also other uh, scripture like um Dao De Jing's that were taking out of like some tomb or something that was written out on silk called the Bo Shu uh, Dao De Jing, which Bo is just a type of silk and whatnot, a, a type of silk uh, book. And they found that the order on that was actually De Jing first and then Dao Jing. So we're, people still speculate which one's first. Which yeah. is something to acknowledge when we talk about these ancient scriptures that it's really hard to pin down uh-huh. specifics in any way. So, so I'm just going said... to give uh, give a, a a warning. Like my, uh, me and Cody's de- uh like kind of like um deciphers over this is probably is just our own interpretations of stuff. Absolutely, right? And we both recommend that if you're interested in this. Get yourself a copy of the Tao Te Ching and read it yourself because Mm -hmm. your interpretation might be different than everybody else's. Yep. And that's okay. That's okay. Like, find something, get something out of it. And also read multiple translations because uh, translation is hard. And not (laughs) just for these uh, imaginative imaginative works. Yeah. It's insane. Without further ado. (laughs) (laughs) Um,. But since it's so hard to pin down um, the ideas behind it, basically, a lot of people speculate whether Lao Tzu even wrote it. But my favorite little Mm. piece of history regarding Lao Tzu writing it is that um, he was very frustrated, apparently, with the way that Chinese culture was going. So he wanted to go into exile. And as Mm. he was leaving China through the Western gates, the gatekeeper, Mm. Yin Si stopped him because he recognized him as a philosopher. Mm. That guy, that gatekeeper, asked Lao Tzu to write a book for him before he left. Lao Tzu Mm. wrote the Tao Te Ching, sitting on a rock. When he Mm. finished writing, he up and left. And uh, it's assumed the gatekeeper distributed the Tao Te Ching. Mm. But I think that's a bit romanticized, but it does sound cool. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's pretty much the story, you know. Like, um, and... The, but the thing is, a lot of scholars, just like a lot of these, um, like sageish, sagacious, sagacious, something like that, like like text, they they speculate that it first of all was Lao Tzu actually a person. Um, one of the guys that I listened to thinks he was, and that like, and that he wrote some of it, but in pro- maybe not all of it. And that he had disciples that that kind of recorded kind of some of the stuff he said, uh-huh. you know. So, um, and he's actually it's kind of interesting because like um, people say that uh, that Lao Tzu, he, another name for Lao Tzu is Lao Dan, and Dan, first of all, Lao means old. So when you say Lao Tzu, you're saying the old master. Yeah, which is very yeah. vague. As a yeah, name. and so. <laughs> The other name for him is Lao Dan, which is usually a more like religious name for him because in like Taoism, there's two types of Taoism. There's the the strict philosophy, but then there's actually a whole full blown religion with like fairies and like gods and stuff too. Yeah, because the Tang Dynasty established it as the state religion, right? 
I'm not really sure, actually. I think I read that, that they were like, we're going to use this as our religion during this era. I thought that was more, I thought that was Buddhism, but I, I, I think Buddhism I don't, came I'm not after. really sure. Because, like, the, I think Buddhism also came in, to Japan during that time as well. That's kind of why I was thinking that way. But I probably mean is, am wrong because, like, I don't pay attention to that very much. <laughs> but, like, um, yeah, like, Lao Dan is an interesting name because it, just hearing the Dan, like, there, Dan is, like, a really weird character because it's written with an ear particle on the side and then it has a ran, which is, like, um... It, it usually like if you say ran ran, it's like 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 smoke kind of wisping along, going up and whatnot, and so it's just being used as like a phonetic thing, like to to make the character. But the main part of this character is the the arzipang, which is uh means ear. So actually, like they call him Lao Dan because he was born with like really big ears, apparently. <laughs> Like over, and that's actually a lot of times what you'll see the statue of him. It's like I, his I ears saw that today. It's this really huge big. eared statue. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, like, I, the guy that I was listening to said that Lao Tzu actually was born like, like an albino. And he was like, he had like really big ears. He was like a really strange looking guy, actually. So, like, um, or let's say unique. He was a unique fellow. Like, um, so like, it, he might have been kind of an outcast in the very beginning of his life. You uh -huh. know? So that might also kind of ha have um, kind of pushed him to just kind of, well, pushed him to look, reflect inside more. But anyway, like, yeah, that's kind of like the story of the, of the, you know, the birth of the Tao. Dao De Jing and a little bit about Lao Tzu. Like I, I just heard this a long time ago, so I'm not really sure if all that is true. But like that's kind of like speculations that I've heard from a, a scholar that actually like studies a lot of these old texts and whatnot. And the Dao being one of the most important in Chinese culture, like yeah, Dao it, De Jing, mm -hmm. it shapes even, a lot of uh, Confucianism and legalism going forward. Yeah, it, it it's one of the most important texts in Chinese culture and to understand cu Chinese culture. And a lot of Chinese people themselves don't even realize how important it is to their own culture. Like, uh, it, there's a lot of concepts that come from the Tao Te Ching and from Taoism in general. And before even that, there's the Book of Changes, the Yi Jing. That is That's, something I have here on my list as well. That may have come before the uh, Tao Te Ching did. Yeah, that's something that they also uh, talk, uh, talk about because a lot of the concepts in the Tao Te Ching um, also reflect those in the Yi Jing. One of the main ones being, um, you it's a, it's a really famous, and pretty much everyone knows it, it is Dao Sheng Yi, Yi Sheng Er, Er Sheng San, San Sheng Wan Wu, which means like the, the Tao... Um, it, sheng is a weird uh, word because it can mean like birth it can mean like generate so like the the Tao births one one births two two births th three and three births all of the ten thousand myriad things so like what huh. it's talking about is that Tao is like this this zero that everything starts off it's like the null that starts everything and then out of nothing becomes one and then out of one becomes two meaning that you have this first like sludge of the universe but then you get two which is yin and yang yin yep. yang right very yin important and yang. part of the philosophy and, and then what is three then that's he so yin yang he so that that's um yin yang and harmony so that's when, like, the harmony between, um, once there's a harmony between yin and yang, then you have the myriad 10,000 things. That's what they always say in, in the Tao Te Ching, wan wu. Wan wu. It literally means, like, 10,000 things. Mm -hmm. Wan, 10,000, and wu. 
And you probably know in Japanese, one is also uh, like uh, 10,000 is probably also something like man or something, right? Yeah, that's actually, yeah, I think that's correct. Because it's the same in Cantonese. And a lot of the sounds in Cantonese are the same in Japanese as well. So like that's that's something that comes back to the Yi Jing because the Yi Jing also talks about things like that, like um, like the elements of the universe and everything. So like there's so much to talk about the Tao. But today I decided we were originally going to do like all these chapters and whatnot. But I decided, OK, a lot of people don't know about Taoism. So why don't we just talk about the first chapter of the Tao Jing and the first chapter of the Du Jing, which is. Um, respectively, chapter one of the whole thing and chapter 38 of the whole thing, right? Yep, that is correct. And today we're going to be working off of the uh, Gian Fu Yang translation mostly. Mm -hmm. and, but we will go back and forth, uh, like some of the parts that, because um, like, like I know Chinese. I re I've read the ancient Chinese version. I've read modern Chinese versions. I've listened to like scholars talk about the Tao and whatnot. So like uh, I also kind of put in my two cents which translations I think are a little better, bit better. And sometimes, like um, pipe. It, I'll also talk about like the different uh, meanings of some of the characters because there's multiple translations for different characters. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the definitely the hardest thing about translating any Asian language into a a phonetic language. Just translating mm -hmm. ideas into words is beyond beyond incredibly difficult. <laughs> translation uh, people don't realize how much translation is an art. Like people, a lot of people have the idea that a language is just like your mother tongue just with different words, uh -huh. but it isn't. It's like a completely different way of logic in seeing the world. And like that can make it very, you have to find a certain kind of finesse to translate well. So like I'll, I'll try to also help with the understanding of the translations and some parts where I think it could be um, expressed a little better, you know? So, Without further ado, and I'm saying that because I used to think the word a d o a do was pronounced ado. <laughs> Little inside, uh, inside joke with yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but let's let's get into the first chapter. Did you want to read? Yeah, I'll this? read chapter one. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of 10,000 things. Ever desireless, one can see the mystery. Ever desiring, one can see the manifestations. These two spring from the same source, but differ in name. This appears as darkness. Darkness within darkness, the gate to all mystery. Mm -hmm. that, and that's... That last part I I have a big problem with, but it it, it gets kind of the point of cross. It's it, it it gets like I would say eighty percent right. Well, let's start so, from the top right away. Honestly, you can immediately tell how esoteric ta ta Taoism is when it comes to mm -hmm. a Western audience. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> to be told that we have the Tao, but mm -hmm. you can't name it is such a <laughs> heady thing to start with. I think. Well, here's a, a good word to to describe it. It's ambiguous. Yeah, that's really good, actually. It's very <laughs> ambiguous. It's protean. It's amorphous. It's like this thing that it in it, like it's something that that's like self. Like what would you contradicting? Everything yeah, in Taoism is always paradoxical. That's a great word. Yeah, it's it's ambiguous and paradoxical a lot of times. So. The first sentence you you have there, in Chinese you say dao ke dao fei chang dao, and so like, see like it's using two daos here. It's the same character, same character dao, and the character itself is actually really interesting. Just looking at the character, what we have is we have a shou. It's show here is not the 
like if you're you know uh, uh, Chinese like rudimentary you probably think oh you're talking about hand no we're here we're talking about show head like the literary version of head you know and then under it you got a foot so you got a head and a foot and it's like it's representing a person going forward pretty much okay all right so that's kind of like like where you get the the translation of the way the road you know to go the forward way. the path yeah. i get it the path and not necessarily to go for like just the natural progression of things almost like uh-huh. you can even like extend it to that definition but dao also has another translation which is to say to speak yeah so um and there w- and it back in in old chinese like a lot of these words could be used interchangeably so like a one word that that is it's pronounced dao can also be used with a different word that's written r- r- differently but is pronounced similarly or the same okay and especially back then they it, it, they didn't have like they didn't have a a regulated language, so they just wrote whatever they thought. It's right. kind of like there's no like, uh, Oxford Dictionary of uh, General Chinese. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That didn't really ha- start to happen until the Qin Dynasty, when like um, Qin Shi Huang, like first regulated like money and like the the writing system and all of this. You know, so he he actually was the first uh, emperor to bring China together, and that's when you actually started getting people agreeing on what characters were what. So, like, just the first three characters are so, like, <laughs> are just have so much death because you have Dao, the first Dao, and then you have Ke, which means can or the ability to, and Dao. So it's stating, the usually what people uh, say it as is Dao. So the the way that can be said, you know, that's uh-huh. uh, that's what how that a lot of people translate it. And then the next three characters are Fei Chang Dao. So Fei means not. Chang is like eternal or constant. And then Dao is another Dao. And this one here is definitely the way. So the first six characters, Dao Ke Dao, Fei Chang Dao. A lot of people um, will translate it as which I think is translated in this translation is the eternal Tao that can be said is not the eternal Tao. Yep. That's just about exactly right. There is another way though, to translate this, which is also really interesting because in ancient Chinese, a word can, doesn't have like a certain grammatical case. So like you would, you can, a word can be like a noun. It can be an adverb. It can be a verb. It can be an adjective. So it's like when you say, it's like, I don't know how to door, you know, <laughs> like you suddenly door is a verb yeah. because you put it in that s- section. Or it's like, or if you say, it's like, Cody, you're looking so dory today. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, and you're the, looking or, like a door. <laughs> yeah. Or if you said, it's like, man, that door just dorily doored itself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like. It's like you almost kind of understand. It's like, man, he really doored that door, you know? Like, <laughs> it can yeah. be kind of like that. And so here, like, Dao could Dao. So this second Dao that what I originally said, and a lot of people say is, means said or told, can also be translated as the Dao that can be taken, the, the eternal way that can be taken as the way is, is not the eternal way. See, like you can uh, interpret it like that as well. Uh huh. And it's weird because you don't really like understand how much death is in the original Chinese language. There can be those six characters, and you have to translate it into English like that. Yep, and, and get the concept across that's agreed upon as the correct concept. Yeah, you. It's. And that's also why when you go to China, you see signs where it's like four characters and then under it, it's like an entire paragraph that like some eighth grader wrote or something of English, you know, like it's crazy, like how succinct 
the Chinese language, especially Wen Yanwen, the original old Chinese language. It's very dense. So, so yeah, like that. So the first six characters, you can either translate as the way that can be said is not the internal way or the way that can be taken as the way or as a road to whatever, you know, of life or something like that, you know, or the inner workings of the universe is not the um the eternal way. And that and that like and actually at the time it could have been taken as both to be honest. Yeah. Because it's it's more uh, getting at the point that the Tao that can be manifested within commun- human communication in any form of the sense of it of communicating is not the eternal Tao. So it exists outside of human understanding. That's like what it's trying to get at. Yeah, that's the big concept. It's just yeah. So it just is. Yeah, exactly. That, and I actually thought about exactly that sentence today. It just is, you know. Yep, and, that, and so, I think that's a lot of the succinctness of Taoism is just, it just is. Yeah, you can see, try to understand well, it, Tao. but it will always be. Yeah, the Tao, well, the it's, way. It's the Tao that's really like that. So it, I mean, like just the first six characters of this book, it's so it. Six characters, you have such a profound statement in there, you know, about the universe, you know. Uh-huh. And this is 2,000 years ago. You got to remember, yeah. there's a guy who just wrote this. Well, maybe not just one guy, but. Let's so, go with just the one guy. It sounds better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so then you have Ming Ke Ming. So Ming, it means name. And you've probably seen in Japanese. Oh, my. Right. Like you, it, you got a. Tian, and then that last part, Ming. I I don't know if you can see. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, like it. So Ming Ke Ming. So Ke we know is is can or ability to. So here it it you have again the same kind of format because the first is Dao Ke Dao Fei Chang Dao. So you have like three Daos. The next part, the next six character, you have Ming Ke Ming Fei Chang Ming. So you have three Mings, right? And the thing is, Ming usually means name, just like it kind of does in Japanese. But there's also another interpretation, which is very close to what I was talking about with the first six one, is Ming can also be translated as Ming Zhuang, which means to manifest into the universe or manifest itself. So, like, it, it can be like the name that can be named is not the eternal name. That's usually what people will translate it as. Mm-hmm. But it can also be understood because of how Ch- old Chinese is so protean and so like amorphous and so ambiguous, you know, with things just like Taoism. It's usually from context that you really understand it. It's like it can also be um, the manifestation that can be manifested is not the eternal manifestation of the Tao. And it, it refers back to itself. Uh-huh. Like it like so it can but like I think people just like the the sound of the name that can be the name is not the eternal name, which the thing is, though, the problem with that is, OK, if you said it like what what the hell is the eternal name? Doesn't if isn't that paradoxical that if the Tao that is said is not the eternal Tao or the way or whatever you want to say it, then how can there be an eternal name? So it can't be told, talked about. So how can there be an eternal name? That's why I have a problem with that hmm. um, translation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get you. Mm. It, it it feels like they're just going with, since you mentioned that it has the three, um, it has the three Daos basically, and the other one has the three mm. Mings. Mm. It's just that it when you write it, in English, you want that poetry feel, I think, still. So a lot of the mm. translations will go with the more um, similar to the previous phrase, especially in these, because it really is like they're pairing every two lines mm. is paired mm. together as a single unit. Yeah. And I think and I, I wonder if it also has to do with a lot of Western philosophers not seeing as uh, Chinese philosophy as philosophy and just more as like poetry. That yeah. could be, especially when the, since this is like a, a scripture book mm-hmm. being poetic. 
Because yeah. a lot of old, like, um, Greek stuff is very poetic. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're trying to make connections to that. It certainly like, could be. It, it's really weird to me that, like, ever since I started my journey with Chinese, like, that no one refers to, like, Zhuangzi and Laozi as philosophy when they're very obviously philosophy. It's just philosophy in a way that we're not used to, you know? Because, mm -hmm. like... With, like, guys like, I don't know, like, Nietzsche. It's like they have, like, giant treatises ready to go, you know? Yeah. And just, like, you just read the treatise and then you're like, I understand the concepts that he birthed into the universe, you know? Like, but with Taoism, it's, like, it's po it's almost po poetic in a way, but it's, it's because the language itself is just so succinct that in Chinese people even nowadays will they they see things that are succinct as being more high in mm -hmm. like you know like more deserving to be learned i'm not really sure like how to really put that concept into words but like well it's, 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 really... it's the idea of being like the simpler you can get a point across the better descriptor it is yeah, because you but can use a bunch the... of fancy flowery words mm -hmm. to describe something, but if somebody mm -hmm. can describe it in three words, they're going to be looked at as more intelligent. Well, like it, at the same time, though, like people in the West do s s seem to think longer is better sometimes, especially like with sentences and whatnot. You'll see like really flowery sentences and whatnot, and people will be like, "Oh my god, that person is just I'm so <laughs> so educated." You know, it, it, in China, it's usually the opposite. Like people, if you can say things in succinctly in few words, then people will be like, wow, thank you for being here and alive and bestowing your knowledge upon us. You know, like <laughs> it, it's it, it can be like that a lot of times. But so like um, in the next part here where they're talking about n the nameless being like the, the start of how. Uh, I think it, in the translation, I think in you this you really have to talk about both of the sentence at the same time because this mm -hmm. really focuses in on the yin yang idea of there always being two counterparts. Basically, there's the nameless and the named that well, work together. It's yeah, it's it's it is because like uh, if we're talking about this in the the uh, the perspective of yin and yang, so like. You also have a uh, because uh, you in Taoism you always have these uh, dichotomies, but the thing is, it's the it's like I said before, like there's yin yang and then there's harmony uh -huh. between yin and yang. So actually, a lot of times, like the dichotomy itself is seen as the thing. You know, it's like you're viewing this as one thing. Like black and white aren't like black. And then white, it's black and white together as mm -hmm. one. At the unit. same time, yep. Because they create each other. You have if you have black, you have to have white. Yep. Or you can't else have black one without doesn't the other. Exist. Yep. Yeah. So like here you have the dichotomy of wu and yo, which is nothingness and and isness. And somethingness. Yeah, and being something, you know? Like a manifestation kind of thing and so in most translations they will they will delineate the per punctuation as wu ming and then tian di zhi shi which wu ming it would be if you put it together wu and ming together ming means name so wu means nothing it can also be lack of something so wu ming the nameless like they, that's what they'll they'll put it as okay and then it'll be Wu Ming and then pause Tian Di Zhi Shi because Tian Di Zhi Shi is just like um, heaven and earth. And then Zhi Shi, it means like um, the start. But it's also a very interesting, Shi is also a very interesting character because it actually in very, very, if you look at the character, it has a woman particle on the side. And then the other part of it is is Thai, which also has it, it um Thai, but it also can be a, a like a homophone with Thai, which Thai means embryo. So back in the day, this shi meant 
embryo. So hmm. when you're looking at the Tao, you have to remember these were very, very crude times. Like in the Tao, there's a lot of like like ref- references to genitals and to like all these like very, very fleshy things, like human mundane things. Like you got to remember that it's like, remember Zhuangzi said that, that it, like when his disciple asked him where Tao is he said it's it's in it's in the rocks it's in dirt and he's like oh it's that low and it's like yeah it's in the worms and he's like it's that low and then he's like it's in your shit (laughs) and then he was just like because like that's what Taoism is it's like finding the beauty and the the substance in shit like you gotta remember Taoism is this philosophy that's so like realistically crude let me say that okay and so like when you say it's like it's the embryo of heaven and earth which in the in the beginning with chinese philosophy and chinese thought in general especially back in the day is everything in the universe so you have heaven and earth and that's the entire universe that's the whole thing yeah but the problem is, and this is an interesting uh, problem with sci-fi, is now we know that there's a there's a tin D outside of tin D. So there's a heaven and earth <laughs> outside of heaven and earth. And so how do Chinese people cope with that? It's the same thing over here. Like when we found out that there was things outside of earth, that messed with our thought. Yeah. You know, it, and that it, messes with Chinese people's thoughts. So it's like, so with this sentence, like... In the original, what most people translate is Wu Ming. It's like nameless. Tian Di Jishu, heaven and earth, heaven and earth's embryo. That's how it literally glosses. But there's another way you can do it. You can, because, uh, and I'll have to say this for the audience is ancient Chinese had no punctuation. It was just all a big old run on sentence and it just all flowed together. And there's, you, you're, there's no way to see what. Uh, a lot of times, like characters by themselves were words. Not now, but nowadays in Chinese, characters group together to make words. Uh-huh. But not back then. It was an agglutinative language, which means it one character is one word, kind of thing. Nowadays, it's not like that. So, the other way you can interpret this is Wu Ming Tian Di Zhi Shi. So here, it's like nothingness. It is named or manifests itself as the embryo of heaven and earth. See, you he- feel the difference there? Yeah, I get you. Uh-huh. So, like, it's talking about, it's almost like, like, um, what is it? I forgot how to say that in English. You know, the, the thing where people, like, are really cynical and, uh, what is it? When they say, "Oh, nothing really matters," nihilism? what is that for? Nihilism. It's very. It's it. It's nihilist in a way, that that because ni- a lot of people don't realize that nihilism really is just the decontextualizing of everything in the universe. You know that a pencil d- is only only means something when you bestow upon it its usefulness. Uh-huh. You know. Because a pencil by itself isn't anything, you yeah, know, it's just a pencil. really. That's that's it's like matter. the core. Yep. Yeah, it's just matter, and it does. If if there was no humans, that would a pencil actually have a use? You know, if a pencil just happened like by chance to manifest itself somewhere in the universe <laughs> without humans, just like it just kind of naturally became a, a pencil all of a sudden, like that pencil wouldn't have a use that we would know as, you know, and so like. That's kind of like what's happening here is this nihilistic um, like idea that nothingness is the beginning of everything, you know? Mm-hmm. And so then you have, so the next uh, sentence here, which is usually trans- uh, 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 glossed or like delineated as yo ming wan wu ji mo. So it's like the named is... What, what, how did, how did the it named say? is the mother of 10,000 things? 
Yeah, see, and there is that 10,000 things, the one woo that I which was Which is basically about. everything. Yeah, which it means that it's really, even like these characters, all these characters have a story behind them. That's what's amazing about it. One, they, that's such an interesting character because you know what one is? Like, it's, it, back in the day, one of the scariest things for people was to see a scorpion. And like what one apparently is, is like a scorpion and it's myriad babies. Like you open up because a lot of people would like let things sit out for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. You would go out to the back and open up a bucket you haven't uh, seen. And then you just see like a a scorpion, a mama scorpion with a myriad, like it looks like 10,000 babies. And so like that's like. Ten, the it's like and you're overwhelmed the feeling of overwhelmingly like like that overwhelming feeling of seeing all that makes people feel like you can't handle that number so uh-huh. that's what one is as like a, <laughs> a number that's too large concept. yep yeah exactly so a lot of times when you're talking about everything you talk about one woo. so like that that like tribal almost urge of just like like a number you can't comprehend and then ooh, like meaning the other you know which means object you know so one would just so you're saying like you usually say the named you know the mirror the mother of the myriad ten thousand things but you can also like the other sentence before it is yo mean one would so you can say the isness is called or manifested as the myriad, the mother of the myriad ten thousand things. See, mm-hmm. I don't know. Is this is this getting like too long long winded, or is it interesting? <laughs> I think it's pretty interesting, but we might be getting into the long winded territory since we need to uh-huh. talk about a second chapter as well, which I think yeah. you have mm-hmm. more to say on. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Well, like I just want to say one more thing about this because, like the the the, it's this two two things they they come out of the same thing different names kind of thing mm-hmm. or different manifestations that's the other thing you can think of it as like the net the last part here um so like both are called darkness that's what that the word they use right but, darkness within darkness is what that last translates as i guess mm-hmm. this word xuan is synonymous with dao so what is Xuan though? Xuan is a color. It's it it's translated a lot as black, but it's not actually really black. What it is, it's a it's a type of dye that they used to use for silk, and it was kind of like black, but it's kind of like that black that has a little bit of green in it, like that little bit of tint of green, little tint of yellow, like that oily so, black. Yeah, that kind of oily black, kind of that greasy kind of like like all almost like a slight 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 olive color to it and so like shin what they're um like think of like in like horror games when you have that kind of black like that kind of thing going on in the distance like a fog okay that's even creepier than just black itself isn't it yeah when it's because it feels like it's almost alive yeah right and so and because there is something that is alive that it's referring to, actually. Um, first of all, it says, so it's both called Xuan. And you got to think about this color, this darkness that feels like something's living behind it, you know. Okay. And then it says it Xuan Zhu Yu Xuan, which means it's it's that color. It's 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 perpetually moving in that direction of that color. It's It's becoming more and more that color that kind of darkness and it's like that mystery because like you can also say Xuan Miao, which means like mystery, like almost like a an ambiguous mystery almost. And then it says Zhong Miao Zhi Men, which means Zhong is like all of something, all of the the things, whatever. And then Miao is that part of that word, Xuan Miao. See, like in modern Chinese, you put these characters together, Xuan and Miao, and you get like this ambiguous mystery kind of word and so now here it's just by itself meow it's like mystery but 
it's also a really interesting thing that there is a woman character on the front of it. Like we got that again. It's refer. It keeps referring. It's you even call the mir- the mother. Of the, you say the mother of the myriad things. You also call it the embryo, it, and it has this woman particle in it. You know, mm, very interesting. And so here, actually, this Shin, what it's referring to, because that last part is like the 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 door to all mysteries kind of thing, but this Shin is actually. There's also a, and they refer to it later on here, is Shen Men, like it's referring to the genitalia of a cow. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, you don't realize how like crude the Tao is. So like you're actually, so you're talking about Shen, these last few sentences are referring to the birthing, the mis- the mis- the mystery of birth, yeah, and the Tao. Yeah, that's that's a really different um, take. And if you if you combine it with the English translation, basically, mm. and you get that extra context, the gate mm. to all mystery becomes just birth itself, almost. Because I mean, like, like the a vagina. Just it be its being, like in just the like the the thing the fact that birth as a a concept of the universe exists is mind boggling. It's insane. It's the birth of another human. That's I, the most insane yeah. process that could ever happen. And it just happens by itself. And see that it's what's it's referring to when we're talking about the Tao. The Tao just is. And it's the same thing with birth. It just is. What? How did the myriad 10,000 things start to exist? It just is, just like birth, you know? And it's 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 just a miracle, you know? It's it's crazy. So, like, it, and it, it might even make fe- people feel uncomfortable to hear that there is this metaphor in here. But that that's, like, what society was really like back then you know it's it, this is like 2000 3000 yeah. years ago 2000 3000 years ago you're just trying to explain how life exists and mm-hmm. i feel that a slight difference in eastern philosophy versus western philosophy that i've noticed in my readings mm-hmm. is that eastern philosophy very much tries to just describe how to life <laughs> whereas western philosophy tries to describe why is life Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure because like it it, de- it really depends because like the Tao de Jing I think is is trying to answer both of those questions. With the Tao, your your the Tao chapters I can definitely see that, but they still apply mm-hmm. a lot to how to be why I don't know. <laughs> well, like I think Confucian is like uh, Confucianism is a lot like that. Yeah, because like a Confucianism is trying to answer the question how to be in this world, and Taoism is trying to answer both of those questions. At least the Tao Te Ching is trying to answer both of those questions. With the Tao chapters, the Tao Jing, you're answering why, how did this universe come to be? What is the starting of this universe? And then in the Dua chapters, you start to th- get into, okay, well, we have this um, manifestation that happened all of a sudden. Like, you can even think of it as the Big Bang. You know? Yeah. Like, because, like, that's actually what the, the, the Big Bang was. Like, it was a point. It was one. So so you got before the point, the infinitesimal point of the universe exploding into the myriad 10,000 things, you had something that made that point. And that's like that null of Tao that we cannot comprehend at all in any sense of the word, you know? And yeah. then something happened to that point. It introduced another factor or something. And then... You start it getting all these like reactions with the two that became harmony, and then through that you start getting things one by one. Like you, I guess you can understand it as like the atoms in the universe starting to collide with each other and making all these more and more complicated things. But then you have the idea of entropy, right? That yep. everything is trying to go back to that state now and trying to like like dissipate and just like become less in 
less and less complicated, right? Like it, it's 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 insane how both Buddhism and Taoism and a lot of these ancient philosophies actually kind of like can be layered on top of like yeah um, you can you can apply physics, them all to each other and physics you know? yeah. <laughs> but um yeah like I mean I guess, so much of this stuff is just trying to explain the physical earth just what what am i looking at and it's and, these people that have these very esoteric thoughts of like what am i looking at and Why they have to try to understand it through their understanding of the world at that time yeah. because nowadays we have stuff like equipment like what is it like the the large hadron collider that can tell us oh this is how the universe kind of started it started off with all these weird collisions of atoms and quarks and all this stuff yeah. and then over here it's just like some guy like some creepy guy looking at a cow vagina <laughs> 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 but I, they, also, I should say that it's it's speculations from scholars, so it it might not be that. But and some people might be angry at that interpretation. Actually, I'm not really sure. But the guy that I listened to, um, what is his name? Wang Zhongdao or Wang Wendao, something like that. That's what he would told it. And it sound it sounds convincing to me, at least when I'm reading things and seeing all these woman particles and whatnot in it and like um also referring to like female cows and whatnot in later chapters as well but let's let's go to the next chapter i guess chapter 38 you want to do the reading laz uh sure let me pull it up here really quick because i i have the chinese version in front of me right now but i do <laughs> read it in chinese it, i'm sure i'll get it i'll get the gist <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay so for the Gia, uh, what's his name? Gian Fu Yang. Uh, Gia Fu Yang. Uh -huh. So, like, um, here it is. Oh, no, that's mine. That's mine. That's my translation, isn't it? Okay, here we go. And I think this guy it does a good uh, translation. Um, I really, I do like it a lot. So, the truly good man is not aware of his goodness and is therefore good. A foolish man tries to be good and is therefore not good. A truly good man does nothing, yet nothing is left undone. A foolish man is always doing, yet much remains to be done. And I really like a lot of that. When a truly kind man does something, he leaves nothing undone. When a just man does something, he leaves a great deal to be done. When a disciplinarian does something and no one responds, he rolls up his sleeves in an attempt to enforce order. Therefore, when a tau is lost there is goodness when goodness is lost there is kindness when kindness is lost there is justice when justice is lost there is ritual now ritual is the husk of faith and loyalty the beginning of confusion knowledge of the future is only a flowery trapping of the tao it is the beginning of folly therefore the truly great man dwells on what is real and not what is on the surface on the fruit and not the flower. Therefore, accept the one and reject the other. Mm -hmm. I really like this chapter. The The whole duo section is great life advice in general. <laughs> it's, this mm -hmm. is when we get into the how to live a good life, basically, that Taoism mm -hmm. purports. Mm -hmm. Which, it, the, the looking at this character, Du, is also interesting because it has a homophone kind of relationship with another character and even if you uh, like so there's another character de, which means to obtain and this homophone relationship can also be seen in uh, in um dialects of chinese that seem that are older so like in in cantonese it's also the same duck duck and even in fang fang's village language it's both debt it, so there, there could have been this homophonic relationship between du, like the virtue, and obtaining, because like when you get from Tao to the myriad things, you're it's like an obtaining of something, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Or and du can also kind of mean like the the arrival of something too. Sometimes, you know. So like it's, it's um. And even looking at the character itself, it's like, 
Uh, there's something there's more stuff to unpackage there but let's just say that for now what what do you <laughs> let me let me ask you because i keep uh, like uh, like flapping my mouth like uh what do because this one i think is a much closer to translation yeah i, I like this translation Laz did his own translation of this section before we started recording and which yeah, is this, less flowery <laughs> and they are very close together like a lot of it is um, yeah I did, yours just provides a lot of extra context yeah, I didn't look at any of the English translations when I translated. I just was looking at the ancient Chinese, and I referred a little bit to the Mandarin to clear some, some things up sometimes. But um, yeah, what did you get from this? Because I'm I'm interested. Like this is a good chapter, and it has a lot to unpackage. Basically, what I get from this chapter, this first part of the digging, is um, just that first line: "Truly, good people are not aware they're good us." You can just to be a good person, you just have to exist and be a good person. It's just is. I. It just goes back to that of you just have to be. And you don't always have to be bragging about all the stuff you do. You don't have to always be trying to do good. This concept of doing something and never reaching it. Mm. Um, that idea that you don't, you don't always have to be looking into the future. Mm. You have to be happy in the present this mm. mindfulness that is very popular in Eastern philosophy of find happiness in the present. And when I say happiness, I do mean not from external sources, but just happiness within that like contentness, that joy of mm. being alive. Mm. Yeah. Like getting that, like going back to the seed, you know, of kind of like, yeah, um, that inner child, like uh, <laughs> ideal it, of just being happy. Like, cause I feel like as a kid, you're always mm. just in a pretty happy mood. The, uh-huh. the default state of youth, I think, is happiness. That's the start. Mm. Yeah, I, like, cause, see, and that's actually something that the Tao says later on in some chapters is talking about going back to the state of being a newborn, you know? And, yeah. like, one that I heard is, like, there's this one where it's, like, oh, what what is it? He was talking about how, like, there's this idea of high which is is a really weird concept because it literally means the laugh, the first laughing of a newborn child. One of the so greatest feelings in the world. Well, it's it's talking about going back before that. So it's talking about like going back to the state of just being completely like a, an empty slate, you know? Because yeah. like when you when a newborn comes out, it's a complete empty slate that just is. Yep. Like all it's at all a baby's actions when they first comes out are just pure, absolutely pure instinct. You know, and it, it doesn't know why it does those. The things. Mo- the first thing it does is breathing. That base mm-hmm. of life is just breath, in mm-hmm. and out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't have to have thoughts; just have to breathe. Which is breathe is breathing. The reason what I was thinking about this the other day, the reason I think a lot of meditation revolves around breathing is because it is the only vital function that if you stopped right now, you would die instantly. Like, yeah. like in that you can control. Like, that's the only you can't control your heartbeat. You can't control the function of your liver, but you can control the function of your lungs to a certain extent. Like, and yeah. I think that's why the like the basis of meditation is learning how to breathe, you know. And yeah. it's also a big thing in Taoism, too. Absolutely. Um, mm. One little pop culture thing I thought of when I was reading this section, this mm. those first two lines, the... Um, Truly good people are not aware of their goodness and are therefore good. Foolish people try to be good and are therefore not good. It reminds mm-hmm. me of Yoda and Empire Strikes Back. The do or do do or do not. There is no try. Mm-hmm. Because when you if you try to be good, you're going to fail your expectations of being good. Mm-hmm. So if you just do good, you're good. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do good, you're not good. So you either do or you don't. Mm-hmm. Well, like, it, see, the, the other thing with... Well, let me, so let me look at the Chinese version here. 
Like, because uh, there's also one thing with uh, Taoism that's because like remember that t- dichotomy I was kind of talking about. Mm-hmm. Like in Taoism, there's no good like like for sure good or bad. Like it's like the the thing is like in Taoism, like the highest good. There is a a very famous line that I see all the time like hung up in Chinese people's houses like as a calligraphy is shang shan ruo shui. This is also a very key um concept in Taoism is is the you can say the highest goodness kind of or the tr- or true goodness is like water. You probably uh, Yeah, I know exactly out. where you're That's, going with it. <laughs> I think it's 11, chapter 11 or, or something like that or 10, I think it's 10. But that the thing is w- what water is and they talk about it. It is about chapter it. It goes, eight for future reference. Oh, okay. Yeah. I I still haven't memorized all of the Tao. But like um like water goes in all these places that people don't want to go to. Water just flows to wherever it, it, it needs to go. You know, it just follows gravity and it just does that. And it doesn't care where it goes. It doesn't have that awareness. And so it's saying the highest, the real good is like water. It just goes wherever it goes. And see, the concept of good in Taoism, which is used the word shan, which in different philosophies in China, like shan can is a little different in each one. Like um, shan uh, in like Buddhism can be a, a long, long topic to talk about. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but here it's it's more talking about because the highest good in Taoism is just going with the flow, pretty much. If you want to take it down to its like mundane level, because a lot of these that's been my attitude also... for life for a long time. Just go with the flow. Mm-hmm. So like. Let me let me look at this really quick, cause like um, it like saying things are good or bad. It in Dow's oh, oh, it's talking to me. Oh no, and it's giving me ads. That's the one thing that I don't like about this app. It just pop and Chinese websites and apps in general. It's like it doesn't matter how much you you pay for memberships, they'll so their ads start to become suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like it's not an like, ad we're just asking you to do this it's like an unregulated free capitalistic nightmare <laughs> <laughs> yeah but anyway like um yeah like when you get to the shang de bu de shi yu you do you know and i'm not going to do like i did before in the the first chapter but it's just kind of saying like the what i kind of put it is like the true virtue does not show its virtue. It's like it doesn't cling to the definition of what virtue is, you know. And this is what true virtue is. And see, du is actually synonymous with that word shan. So like shang shan ruo shui, the, the highest uh, good is like water, that shan there. See, in that shang, shang means up, like high okay. up. Yeah. So here, you first you have shang shan, which is the highest uh, goodness or the true goodness you can also uh, see it as, which I like saying it like that a little better. But like uh, then you have shang de, the highest virtue, the real virtue. And so goodness and de, virtue, to uh, Lao Tzu or uh, Taoists in general is going with the flow and not following what's good or what is said by others. Uh huh. What is good or bad? And see, this is coming back to the first chapter as well, because the highest goodness and and the Tao and stuff like there, you see Ming like the names for things as ambiguous, and you actually look more at the the actions, you know, and that's why actually what this gets into later on, because then you got the concept of Wu Wei, right? Right, going with the flow. Did you did you watch that video? I did watch that video. It was very good. What you get from it? I the just the idea that if you just go with the flow in general life takes you where you need to go. 
Mm -hmm. Just it don't try to force things. It's Mm. it causes more friction when you try to push against the flow or like in a way that isn't naturally coming to you. Not to say like don't try hard or be ambitious, but Mm. if things are meant to happen, they're just going to happen. Yeah. So it's always best to just go with it. I think it's more... Because it's really this idea that you don't actually have control. A lot of life, you don't have any control over. So just accept that you don't have control over it and just take it as it comes. Well, and there's an extension to that. Like, it it, it kind of also reminds me of, like, I think Jim Carrey said it, like, always turn in the direction of a skit, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Like, so, like, building on that, there's, so you, there's, like you said, life is going to come at you, and no matter what, it's going to be like a torrent, and, like, you're just going to have to go in the flow of it. The other thing is to that is, like, when you decide to just let go and go with the flow you actually have more choice when you, when you decide, okay, the, the river's going to flow that way. Then I can start to decide, do I want to go left or right? Yeah. When am I going to exit this part of the river? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Cause yeah, if you're, if you're saying I'm going to reach that rock that's up the river, you're never going to reach it. Yeah. Like, because like the force of the universe is all coming down on you. Like you might as well just go down then, you know? Um, so like, but then there's, it, it's not like people might say, well, how about a waterfall? Are you just going to go down a waterfall? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, but that's the thing. Waterfalls it's, don't exist in this concept. It's all a river. Yeah. Gosh. Well, like, <laughs> see, the, the thing you can also, like, you can see this as more of a meta concept, like, like the flow of things, like the workings of things. So if you were in a situation where there's a waterfall, you would have to work with the the factors in that environment like part of it is like almost the knowledge and the instinct to get out of that situation Uh is also like the flow you know so like i mean because it's kind of like like for instance like if there if i'm a a like like a giraffe and there's some tasty leaves up on on high there what do i do i just extend my neck up and that's actually part or part of it too. And actually, it's put more on in the Zhuang in Zhuangzi, more um, is just like the innate workings of bodies and stuff like that. You know, like like how do like like animals like a four legged animal looking at a snake, and it's like how the hell do you move? <laughs> you uh-huh. know, it's like I just do it. <laughs> you know, and it's like the snake looks at them, and it's like how do you do move with those stubbly things? It's like your body can't slither. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like things like that. So like the flow, and you were talking about it, right too, like like when you the create friction with that flow, then you become what the guy with um yeah. Uh, how do you say his name in English? Yang like, Yang. Yeah, Gian Fu Yang. Because it's always opposite in Chinese. Uh-huh. Feng Jia Fu. But like, um, yeah, like um, he says like the, the man that doesn't know or something like that. Like, oh my God, I need to open it up again. <laughs> the the <laughs> foolish man. That's the yeah. foolish man tries to be good and he and, and nothing it like gets done kind of, right? So like... um. That's actually so. Wu Wei is more of like the person that decides. Okay, the river's going that way. I'll go that way, and then I can move more freely through that way instead of going up, yeah. kind of thing. So it's also if you pl- apply it to a bigger scope, like dying, or like the the process of death and accepting your own death. Like you find freedom when you accept your own death. Yeah, like the concept when, of mortality I, is with all of us. You have to deal with it. Exactly. And actually that kind of goes that also kind of goes with like like kind of like the 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 stoics idea of the memento mori, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you accept your own death and know that it's it's inevitable, then you just you 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 don't become afraid of it anymore and you just like cuz like I I heard it somewhere. I forgot I think it's in a concept in yoga, actually. Oh, no, it's a, a concept. Yeah, it is a concept from one of uh, Fanfang's teachers, uh, one of the guys in India that 
um, that um, that studied under Iyengar, like one of like one of the most profound human beings ever to exist in this earth. But like, um, like he said, like yoga is about learning how to have a good death. And this is actually a concept that I've heard actually in somewhere in Western philosophy. I've definitely well. heard that in Western philosophy somewhere. Because, like, if you think about it, everyone's wanting to have a good life. But the thing is, if you have a good death, it means that your life before you is meaningful in some way. You know? Mm-hmm. Which... That's, that's in the Tao as well. Mm-hmm. Is it? I, I think that... Yeah, I think that's in the that's either in the Tao or it's in the Zhuangzi. There is a very similar mm-hmm. idea to that, that because with, with a good death you live on basically in eternity. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, like with Taoism at, in the religion, there's like um, what is it reincarnation and whatnot. Yeah, but in the philosophy, I think I think Taoism, it's more ashes to ashes, dust to dust idea of just yeah, that's it, you're done. Yeah, pretty and actually in the Zhuangzi, there is a famous scene. Where, like, um, a guy, like, uh, and this is, like, the weirdest scene ever. And Drongza is kind of a, what is it? He's a eclectic fella. So, like, and all the Taoists, including myself, <laughs> are kind of eclectic, right? <laughs> so, like, um, the, the, the thing, so it goes, and you probably read it in the Drongza, is, like, the guy is, like, he's tired, so he decides to get off of his cart and take a nap by the... The road, and he just finds a human skull there, and he's like, "Well, this would make a great pillow." Oh, yeah, I just read this the other day. <laughs> and so, well, do you remember the story? Yeah, absolutely, I remember it. Then he uh-huh. sleeps with it, and uh, and the skull comes to him in his dreams, mm-hmm. and they talk for a bit. I don't remember the specifics of that part, but at the end, he asks, "Would you come back to life?" And the skull says, "Why would I return to living when I can stay the way that I am?" Yeah, and he said, and when I have the happiness, more happiness than kings. Yes. Yeah. Why would I return to the trappings of life or whatever it is? Yeah. Really oh good my God. sentiment. Because, like, think about it. Like, we don't, and you can even think of it as, do you remember y- your your experience before birth? You know? <laughs> Unbirth? No, not at like, all. like, the thing is. If you think about it, we have experienced death before. It's before birth. Yeah, it's before birth. So that's such an interesting idea to think of is when, like, does your does your soul exist before mm-hmm. your physical? Uh-huh. Because so, if it does, then yes, we've experienced this death, this unlife. Mm-hmm. But if the soul begins when you beca- get a physical body, then we haven't mm-hmm. because we just mm-hmm. are physical until we're not. You know, I... I really want to ask someone well versed in like some sort of Christianity, like what is their thoughts of life before life? Like, because I've never heard a concept from Christianity about. Yeah, that. I've never There's actually heaven hell. heard but, that like, section of it. Yeah, like what I wonder how, what they make of life before life, or how does life happen? You know, like I, I, I'm very. I I'm think kind the of concept interested. is the divine spark. Is that uh-huh. life is at conception maybe i mm. think i feel like that's that divine spark but wait mm. i don't know further than that uh. that's way off topic <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's well, reel I mean, back like... in i actually want to talk about this section mm. second section here yeah. the the foolish people are always doing all the way down to the when the disciplinarian responds because mm. this to me rings very much with chinese culture at the mm. time of people above the peasant class trying to force the peasant class to do things Mm. and I'm just going no why would we do that Mm. so it's this ruling class doesn't belong in the concept of enforcing rules basically that's against Taoism or that's that's unharmonious yeah they don't have the heart of the people yeah there's actually a really famous story about that in Chinese because like Chinese history, a lot of it is like these really interesting anecdotes. Yeah. And one of them is, um, what is it? Something, something, Li, uh, like Li Fa, I for, Li Mu or something like that. So the story goes like, I forget who it is. I think it was Mo Zi or, so, yeah, I think it was Mo Zi. He was like the starting of like the Fa Jia, which is like the, 
like the law, the school of law. Kind the of legalists, thing. I think is the what they're called yeah, now. I think yeah. that's it. I think it's Muitz that started it. So like the story goes that um, he wanted to have people like follow the law and to obey and abide by the law. So what he did was he didn't like, like, you know, do the whole dictatorial kind of like um, pounding of the iron fist kind of thing. What he did was he told people, okay, he took like this giant, like this ungodly giant piece of wood, like this giant pole and put it on one side of the village uh, of this village, let's say. And he said, whoever can get this pole from this side of the village to the other side of the village gets 1,000 gold pieces, which is insanely godly. That's a lot of money. I think it was actually more 100 pieces, which is still insanely godly. That's <laughs> yeah. like a piece of gold back then was like this little thing like this. It was like like probably like a half pound of gold. Yeah. Like one, that, so that's like I, And a peasant never saw gold. gold. I guarantee it. Yeah. So like <laughs> then he was like, uh, so everyone was like, no, you, you gotta be kidding. You gotta be kidding. What, what's going on with that? What's going on? And then, then people were like doubting him for a long time, but then someone did it. Like they, they, they start trying to do it. And then someone actually got it to the other side and was like, yep, here you go. Like, here's the gold. And they're like, wow, he's ac- he actually is being truthful to his word. And then that's when people started listening to him because what he said was worth its weight in gold. It was like uh, he, what he yeah. said was what he meant. And so that's what where he started getting people to listen to his laws was because they knew that whatever he said was what was going to happen. And so, so when you get the trust of people like that, that's when you can start really getting disciplined. And see, that that even goes back to this idea of shang de, bu de. So like the the true virtue, it doesn't look virtuous because it doesn't need to. The, yeah, the, it just the thing with The thing with Taoism is, and in this chapter in particular, the main tenet that you want to get from this is that as soon as there has to be an acknowledgement of kindness in the world, that means kindness has failed. So that's when you uh, people start coming up with all these crazy theories. And that's why he says, like, at the end, um, So it's like knowledge and wisdom is like the, fa- the facade of Tao, the facade of the way. Uh-huh. And that is the start of foolishness. So that's what he's talking about. He's talking about when kindness is starts to be acknowledged as a thing to to go after, to pursue. That's when you know there's been been like a disturbance in the universe. Yeah, a disturbance that kindness in the way, now has to be re- recovered. That's when see because when you don't need to acknowledge kindness, that's actually the highest virtue. That's yeah. actually the true virtue because it's like you said, like. A good person is just good. And they, it's not and but in the Taoist tradition, it's more that a good person is just like is the thing that it be he or she or it or like they, you know, like whatever you want to call it. I'm saying it because in my mind, I'm thinking of like humanity at its like start, you know, mm-hmm. And I feel so like distanced from that that I just call it it, you know. <laughs> but so it, it, you get to a point where you get it's in a bestial state, and the, a lot of times they, uh, in Taoism you can kind of understand it as this bestial state is almost like the good that, uh, but not quite that. Just being what you are and just being as it is as you are kind of yeah Taoism has this idea that humans are inherently good like everything is inherently good because they're going with the way and the way is good so mm -hmm. that primordial state that first state will always be the good state Mm -hmm. it's uh, it's such a because like it's 
he just is, is saying like pretty much everything that happens is just happening and just it's not even really accepting it it's it's hard to put because a lot of things you get in buddhism and Taoism, it gets to this place where it's like everything is everything else and it just is <laughs> and then it gets into like that and i remember thinking this in high school is like that the dichotomy itself is the truth the paradox itself is the truth. It's not, okay, like, is it yes or no? It's like the question itself is the truth kind of thing, the paradox. It's yes and no at the same time, uh -huh. you know? And at the same time of it being yes and no at the same time, it isn't yes and no at the same time. <laughs> so it gets An into endless, this like, endless loop and cycle where you get stuck in meditation. And that's why I tell you, be careful uh -huh. what you're thinking about when you're breathing in and out. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's the, the thing, like, about Taoism in general is, like, and that we start on just these two chapters, getting into Taoism is exactly kind of, like, what you need. Like, every, every almost everything else is, like, in a an elaboration of these two chapters, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, that's a, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> this has been a great episode. Hey, if you like what we're doing, be yeah. sure to hit that like button. Throw us a comment and subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, follow us on Spotify. And if you could rate the podcast on iTunes, give it five stars. Uh -huh. I think that's all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like <laughs> iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, um, Google Play. Um, what else? What are those other like really out there ones? Uh, we're on like... Deezer. We're on Stitcher. Oh, yeah. We're on Deezer we're on and Stitcher. iHeartRadio. Uh -huh. uh, Podcast Addict. We're also on Queeper and Deeper. <laughs> okay. Whew. And VVV all the way home. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> all the ones Laz said are totally fake. Don't go looking for those. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm gonna have. We're gonna have links in the YouTube description, and I guess the general description of um, the Tao Te Ching, some mm -hmm. of the external reading we did. Um, like the video on Wuwei I'm going to put in. So mm. be sure to yeah. check that stuff out if you like what we're talking about here. And yeah. pick up a copy of the Tao Te Ching. Pick up a copy of uh, Zhuangzi. Mm. Just read this stuff and get your own interpretation. Yeah, and you it's can also well put worth it. The, yeah, you can also put the links to those on Amazon as yeah. well. Um, and, and then I'll also put maybe if anyone understands Chinese uh, like Mandarin out there like I can also put links to those too or if you just kind of want to like just listen to it I don't know like sometimes I like to just listen to languages that I don't understand uh -huh. <laughs> so you know all right well yep this was a fun time let's mm. hop back in that pond yep and go splish, looking splish, nice and chill splash splash it's Go with the flow. It's summertime, so we got to cool down. All right. <laughs> Bye, Goodbye, everybody. everybody.